LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, wildlife control consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Glad to have you on board. I hope you've had a good week. I had a so-so week myself. So I'd, I would love if you'd take a few moments, if you would, and subscribe to the channel and make sure you ring the bell so that you'll be notified of any future updates. Those of you that are looking for my information directly, you'll often sometimes see me publish a little faster. On Rumble, you can just go to Wildlife Control Consultant. Search there at rumble.com, rumble, R-U-M-B-L-E.com, and I post my videos there as well. But so you can get them on YouTube through uh, Pest Geek Podcast or through Rumble. So we'd be glad to have you uh, join us and keep up to date. Of course, I'm always looking for feedback and information on new topics and subjects you would like to have covered. Perhaps you have invented something or want to sell something or just talk about something that's bothering you about the industry. You can certainly reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. That's wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Again, there's no S on the end of that consultant. So it's wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Well, I do hope you're preparing yourself for Thanksgiving. Maybe by the time you hear this podcast, maybe after Thanksgiving. So I do hope that you've had a joyous one with friends and family. Well, this week, I thought I would talk about something that I got in my inbox so let me kind of pull that up here and this is a publication entitled the external stakeholder research needs assessment that's pretty academics definitely have long titles published by the USDA APHIS wildlife services now if you're not familiar with wildlife services wildlife services is the arm of the federal government It is an agency within the Department of Agriculture, and they are tasked with protecting human interests, crops, disease. They also deal with invasive species, and they are basically the wildlife control wing of the federal government. Now, a wing of the Wildlife Services organization, about 10% of their budget, at least last time I looked, covered the National Wildlife Research Center in Fort Collins, Colorado. The National Wildlife Research Center is the research arm of wildlife services. So to make sure you get this, wildlife services has basically two components. One component is field work. These are individuals who are trained in wildlife damage management, and they would control things like coyotes, They could do wolves, they may do bears, they'll do invasive birds, they will do non-invasive birds, they will do uh, things involving disease uh, control, uh, and anything that relates to some sort of wildlife damage. For example, they're involved in controlling the brown tree snake in Guam. So, and they will even go around the world. Some of the individuals within the Wildlife Services Agency have an obligation to be ready to go on a flight anywhere in the world, I think within 48 hours. So I think it paid a little extra if they're on that list where they could be called to go to a foreign country to deal with maybe a disease, a zoonotic disease outbreak. They're also involved in disease surveillance as well. So they have some major components. A lot of it's, of course, dealing with agriculture and livestock production, you know, protecting ponds from uh, herons and that sort of thing. Animals are going to come in and eat all, eat the person's fish, deer coming into crops, ravaging crops, and of course, birds hitting sunflower fields. And so there's a that sort of a control and active component within wildlife services. But there is a research component within wildlife services, and that's done by the National Wildlife Research Center. So when you, just as a side note, that's not really the focus of my presentation today. So while 
many or some, I don't have any data on the statistics of it, some wildlife control operators have struggled with wildlife services because they see wildlife services as a financial competitor to their business. Uh, whether that is true or false to the extent that the person experiences, that's not the subject of today's topic, although I'd love to hear your thoughts from it. There have been complaints in the past that wildlife control operators have lost business because wildlife services have been hired or con consulted or contacted to perform the services. So you can see that there is some tension between the private industry, the wildlife control operator industry, and wildlife services. For those of you in the pest control field, think of it as if your city or municipality or county had a pest control person who was doing cockroach control in various restaurants in the city. How would you feel about that for a government agency to be involved in doing pest control in various businesses under the guise that it's part of the public interest? So that is where some of the wildlife control operators feel that there have been some competition. Now, my understanding is, is that there's been some mutual uh, memorandums of, of understandings between wildlife services and the wildlife control industry, in that uh, I have not heard anywhere near the number of reports. In fact, I haven't heard any real conflicts between private industry and wildlife control services in some time, actually. So if there are others out there uh, who are having some challenges with wildlife service, I would love to hear from you. So I think that's worthy of a podcast to explain your particular situation. So I am just say all that, not to go down that rabbit hole of competition between wildlife control operators and wildlife services, my point is, is that there's some animosity there. However, a portion of the budget for wildlife services is done for research. And this is where I think that a lot of wildlife control operators are a little bit too short-sighted when they criticize wildlife services, and that is they need to be careful of how broad of a brush that they paint about wildlife services. So whether you're for them or against them, I, I do hope that you consider that the research arm of wildlife services uh, is something that I would encourage wildlife control operators to pay more attention to, because if, if they're not doing the research, who will? Now, this particular publication that we're going to talk about today, it's again, let me read it again for you. It is the External Stakeholder Research Needs Assessment. So what National Wildlife Research Center is asking, they did a survey of various stakeholders. Now, what's a stakeholder? A stakeholder is anyone who thinks that they have an interest in wildlife damage management. That's a stakeholder as, as they would probably define it. I don't agree with that definition, but nevertheless, that would be likely the definition that they would use. So they're asking basically the public who has interest in wildlife damage management what they think the National Wildlife Research Center should spend its time on. What should, you know, the National Wildlife Research Center has a budget and they have to allocate resources, both in both the labor of their researchers and the money that they're investing in this. And they need to figure out where they're going to put it to have the biggest bang, because as a government agency, they need to be responsible and to their constituents, right? I mean, we all, and I think that's a reasonable thing. I hope no one would agree, would disagree with that, that a government agency that's tasked with a certain role it makes perfect sense for them to reach out to the community and ask them, what do you want us to do? And I, and if we don't tell them, then that's on us, right? I mean, I think in fairness, I mean, uh, that's a fair question to ask. And that's basically what they asked. And so I thought wildlife control operators would be interested in what their results were because they've published it here in this particular document. So let me give you a little bit more information. I, I tried looking it up online. I wasn't able to find where it's been published 
online yet. So my suspicion is this is so new that the search engines haven't been able to get it. But I even went on the APHIS website and wasn't able to pull it up. So maybe it just hasn't been indexed yet. But nevertheless, we're going to give you a thumbnail sketch. We're not going to read it word for word. God forbid, that's going to be boring as all get out. But we will cover some of the highlights of the findings of this. And I'm wanting you to just be informed as business people where is your piece of the pie in this? And I'm just throwing that out there, right? You've heard me talk multiple times about the failure of the wildlife control industry to engage government. You know, we have, uh, I would suspect that the majority of your wildlife control associations are spending all of their energy on training. And training is very important. However, I'm arguing that it, ha it can't be done to the exclusion of governmental engagement. And unfortunately, I know I've been kind of a voice screaming against the wind because it's hard for people who are struggling in their business to think about long-term issues when they're trying to put food on the table in the next 72 hours. However, I'm, my point is if you're not thinking about the future, you may not have to worry about the next 72 hours. And so what I find in the industry is we tend to be reactive rather than proactive. And so clearly you as wildlife control operators don't have the time to be doing all this. And that's what associations are supposed to be for. My point is, is that not that the associations should spend all of their energy in governmental lobbying and engagement, but they should be spending spending. Is it 10% of their time? Is that too much? Because I'm telling you, I don't believe they're even spending that much time. And I think that is very short-sighted. But let's, but don't take my word for it. Let's look at what the results are of this particular stakeholder event. And let's talk about what they've done here. So I hope you can see down the screen. So there are going to be some interesting graphics to look at here. For those of you who are driving, you may want to come back and view it online. Uh, certainly, you don't want to be viewing your cell phone while you're driving. God forbid that you're doing that. So nevertheless, let's have a look at this. So there's your there's the there's a table of contents, and here we have the executive summary on page three. So let me uh, pull this up here and kind of blow it up so you can see it a little bit better. So what they did was they surveyed. 231 what they call external stakeholders. Those are people who are interested in wildlife damage management who are outside of the government agency. And they interviewed, they asked people from government, academia, that's like your universities, private organizations and nonprofit sectors to participate in this survey. So they sent this mailer or email out to 231 individuals who were representative of various organizations throughout the country. Only 85 surveys were received and evaluated. And some of those surveys weren't done completely. So that's about a 33%, you know, give or take, uh, response rate, which is pretty good because sometimes surveys you get down to the 5%, 10% response rate. So they got about a third of their response rate. But here's the question I'm going to ask. Was your association asked to participate? If it was, did your organization respond to the survey? If it wasn't asked, why wasn't it asked? So that's an issue is like, kind of like, what are we spending our money on, right? So you're spending your annual dues to an organization that's supposed to be representing your interests. What exactly are they doing? Is it just training or are they doing something else? All right. So I'll leave that to you to be thinking about because we, you need to be thinking about where, where your money is going in various associations. So they found that 43% of the respondents to the survey did collaborate with the National Wildlife Research Center. So that means these were individuals who had some sort of research type of relationship with the National Wildlife Research Center. Because understand the National Wildlife Research, research Center has a budget 
and those dollars only go so far. So what they always try to look for is universities or associations or nonprofits to work with so that they can magnify the impact of that money so that they may have a researcher who will create a research protocol and then they would work with a nonprofit organization who may be able to put boots on the ground to perform the, the grunt work of the research. And that way they're able to multiply the impact of that money. It's, it's very clever and it's very smart. It's a very wise way to do that. So a number of their people, almost half of their respondents who did respond, have already had a prior relationship with the National Wildlife Research Center. And among the sectors of with three or more respondents, 100% of the respondents from other federal agencies that included military had collaborated with the National Wildlife Research Center. That was the number one group, which makes sense. Government people talk to government people. The next most common group was the academia, which of course, that makes sense. Researchers need to have you know, publish or perish. They need to have research opportunities in order to, to advance the science. And then federal natural resource agencies, again, those government, government people, and then industry commodity groups, and that is agriculture. So obviously, if you're a farmer or you're a rancher and you're suffering wildlife damage, that's costing money right out of your pocket. So you're clearly going to be invested into getting research done on wildlife damage management. So it makes perfect sense that those would be the primary groups who would be responding because they've had a longstanding relationship with the National Wildlife Research Center. So of the so here's, now what were some of the results of those research, excuse me, what were some of the results of their survey? What did people say were the key research needs that they thought the National Wildlife Research Center should be partaking in? Where should the National Wildlife Research Center be putting its money? So they had a total of 294 research needs were identified they were in turn organized into 275 categories i i mean just that's wow that's amazing all right so that's that's a little overwhelming and i think everyone would agree with that there's so that's a pretty diverse number of projects okay most of these represented a single survey response that could not be combined with other responses so you can see that there is a tremendous diversity of needs across the country. So how does the National Wildlife Research Center prioritize those? When you have that many mouths to feed or that many issues to deal with, how do you pick which one when there are only a single person that responded with that particular issue? That makes it hard. So in fairness to the National Wildlife Research Center, that's a tough job, right? And so it comes down to politics. As much as people may hate politics, government agencies do rely on public support. And so they have to figure out where their bread is buttered, right? They want to have the biggest impact because they want to survive, right? So it's hard for them to do what I'm going to call orphan projects, projects that only involve that impact a few people. Right? That doesn't mean that the National Wildlife Research Center doesn't think that those issues aren't important, but if you have a decision to make, am I going to spend money on a project that affects 10,000 people, or am I going to spend money on a research product that, attack, that affects five, well, which one do you think the government should put its money into? I mean, that's just the reality of it, right? So they have a tough job. What they found were that by sector, the top five research needs topics were predators, almost 21% of the needs, wildlife disease, 41% of the needs, feral swine and aviation ha airport hazard management, 22 or about 23% each. Academia was asking for bird-related research, about 30%. Industry commodity groups bird uh, required bird-related research needs about 44%. You say, Stephen, that adds up to more than 100%. That's right, because some because they were doing this on the basis of sector groups. 
state natural resource agencies were one sector. The private sector was another sector. Federal natural resource agencies were another sector. Uh, academia was another sector and industry commodity groups were a fifth sector. So they were basically saying what were the number one issues for each of those sectors. So essentially state agencies said predators, private sectors said wildlife diseases, federal agencies says feral swine and aviation airport hazards, and academia said bird research and industry was saying bird related research. So you can see some themes there. Predators for state wildlife agencies, that makes sense. Bears, wolves, coyotes, okay? And, uh, well, probably feral swine, although they're, you know, that's probably in there. And then, of course, you have federal agencies with their airport hazards. They're, they're going to have aviation airport hazards, which, of course, is significant. Feral swine is a national issue. Academics like to be dealing with probably a lot of bird issues, so that seems to be kind of hot right now. And then, of course, industry commodity groups were pointing out bird-related issues as well. So you can see those are the big those are the big five. So when they were asking about tool needs, they found what kind of a piece, what kind of equipment was needed. Respondents, they said, identified 57 tools or methods that needed improvements, and they were organized into 12 categories. The five categories that were the biggest were predator management tools and methods for research, miscellaneous, wildlife disease vaccines, feral swine control and detection, aviation hazard management, so that's about like that. So let's take a look at elements of the full report here. And I want you to take a look, those of you who are able to look online and able to follow me here. Here is, an, here is the table that shows the, the agencies and organizations that responded to the survey request. And so I'm just gonna highlight a few of them here to kind of give you a feel for which organizations responded or perhaps were asked. So we have the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Cornell University, Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks, the North Carolina Wildlife Research Resources Commission, a private, I'm sure that's maybe a private individual, Unidentified State Natural Resources Agency, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, American Bird Conservancy, American Sheep Industry, uh, let's see, Canada, Alberta Environment and Parks, Defenders of Wildlife, so you can see that National Wildlife Research Center was reaching out to what I would call a, a quasi-animal rights group, although they're not a, probably officially an animal rights group. Certainly they would probably be classified as an animal welfare group. Uh, a military organization, Flat Rock Boer Goats, that was located in Oklahoma, that sounds like a producer there. Jefferson County Open Space, Colorado, Maryland Department of Natural Resources, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, Missouri Department of Conservation, Montana Department of Natural Resources and Conservation. And I'm just kind of looking through here to see if we see any from the wildlife industry. And unfortunately, Fortunately, I'm not, although there are some individuals who are not identified and they're entitled as self-employed. So I don't know whether that constitutes someone from a wildlife control industry or not, but I have not seen anything here from the wildlife, the private wildlife control industry, nor from the pest control industry. So I think that's a problem. And I would encourage members to discuss with their either their state association, if they're involved with a national organization, certainly speak with them. But I think that why weren't the private wildlife control operators consulted? Maybe some of these individuals that are unidentified were part of that. Although one says, you know, unidentified livestock operation owner. Maybe it was part of that two-thirds who didn't respond 
and that would be a problem. So that may be a question that you may want to ask in regards to that. All right, well, enough of that. Let's kind of go down here. Here's a graph that shows the organizations, uh, a summary of the organizations that they consulted with. And you can see the vast majority of agencies that responded were natural resources agencies related to states. So that's your state wildlife agency. 34 responded to the survey, and then it goes, then it drops precipitously from there. Federal agencies were next. There were seven from the private sector, seven from academia, and then you have military and some various industry commodity groups of various, of various levels. But that's effectively it. And so there's not really a whole lot uh, there, which is a little disappointing. So respondents by the type of work that they did, they classified who was responding to the survey. The vast majority of individuals were involved in some level of administration or program coordination, which makes sense because they're the individuals who have to organize state agency resources or federal agency resources to respond to various complaints. So they would be kind of feeling the pulse of those types of issues. Uh, let's see. Here's an interesting graph talking about the number of respondents that dealt with wildlife damage or disease issues and how often they dealt with them. So again, of those respondents who came through, what, 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 what are they encountering on a daily, weekly, or commonly basis? And what they found was 36 respondents dealt with wildlife issues daily, 27 dealt with it weekly, nine monthly, five rarely, eight every few months. So you can see that over half were dealing with wildlife damage issues on a at least a weekly basis, which is <clears throat> rather remarkable. Talks about individual organizations that were involved with collaborating or initiating research with the National Wildlife Research Center. And you can see the number of organizations in, by category who were involved with the National Wildlife Research Center. Because again, as I said before, the National Wildlife Research Center is looking for partners to collaborate with and share resources so that they can do bigger projects or take existing projects and add on and multi have a multiplier effect so that maybe the project can do a little bit more. Uh, I tried at one point with the National Wildlife Control Operators Association, I had the opportunity to do a research program with the National Wildlife Research Center, but at least, no, it wasn't the National Wildlife Research Center. It was with a researcher out in I believe it was Ohio, who was doing some work with raccoon scat. <clears throat> we were, so we were going to be able to, with just a small amount of money, I think I got half the funding from the insurance industry and the other half I needed to have come from the private sector. And we're only talking, I think it was $1,500 at the time. It might have been 3000 but it was no more than that. And uh, that was just half. And so we were a, the research project was going to be how long does it take to kill Bayless Ascaris procyonis eggs in various types of environments? For example, we do know that raccoon roundworm eggs, that's Bayless Ascaris procyonis eggs, do desiccate, that means they dry out over time in dry environments. If they're in a moist environment, they can last for decades and be infective. But in dry environments, they desiccate out and die. Well, isn't that kind of important when you find raccoon droppings in an attic? But wouldn't it be nice to know when would that, when would those droppings be most likely no longer infective? I think that would be interesting information. So what they were going to do was they were going to take these raccoon scats uh, and gather the roundworm eggs, which they already had, and then put them into uh, drying chambers so they could monitor both the temperature and the humidity and then determine at different levels when did those eggs die. 
So the goal would have been if we can create a chart that would say, okay, under these conditions, the eggs last two weeks. Under these conditions, the eggs last two months. You could theoretically take some humidity and temperature sensors, put those in the attic, and then create where there's a high probability, you know, get the data and then have a high probability that 99% of those eggs would be dead before you even began doing work. Now, there's going to be other bacteria and things up there and, you know, parasites and what have you maybe in the attic. But at least we could find why those, we could at least learn when, when that particular uh, parasite was dead. Unfortunately, I, I couldn't get funding from the National from the National Wildlife Control Operators Association. This was ooh, back in 2007, 2008, maybe. Uh, so uh, it's been a long time ago, but that was a very sad day. And it was a missed opportunity and um, to have some research done and it would, that would have been helpful for our industry. But uh, nevertheless, that's that's kind of what happens. You get you miss those opportunities. So let's continue through here. Types of collaboration. You can see that there. Provided materials, wrote reports, collected data, this sort of thing. Reasons why no collaboration occurred. Now let's get down into the research needs. And this is something that I thought was rather interesting. So again, they received 294 responses from their survey, from the people that they surveyed. They then took those responses and put them into 275 need categories. Then from there, they clustered them into 38 clusters of categories. And then they reduced that down to 16 topic areas. So again, this is the National Wildlife Research Center struggling with trying to take all of these disparate requests and trying to uh, distill down to those core elements so that they can try to figure out where they can get the most bang for their research dollars. So this is an interesting way in terms of their methodology. It's quite clever if you ask me and how they're doing this because there's some, in fairness, I know some of the people there, there's some smart folks there. So to put it visually, this is how they would do it. A topic area would be bird related needs. Then the cluster would be agriculture or fish eating birds. And another cluster would be vultures, for instance. And then they would go down to need categories, bird deterrent on shellfish. So the need categories would be the specific issue that a, maybe a producer is having. That is, he needs a bird deterrent to keep the birds from eating their fish and shellfish. Or how do we get rid of pel how do we get pelicans away from catfish ponds, right? So that's the specific. But when you start distilling it down, you get to those broader issues. That's the topic area. So in terms of topic areas by frequency needs, they found that rabies was a big one, predators was second, bird-related research needs were third, airport aviation hazard management was third. Everything else drops off from there. You have invasive species other than feral swine, that was next. Feral swine was tied. Then you have rodents and small mammals, deer and cervids, human dimensions and communication, other wildlife research needs, other repellents and deterrents, genetics, economics, fertility management, other methods and tools, and then drones was the lowest. Now, the question I want to ask you, and again, is for wildlife damage managers like yourself, who are in the business of wildlife control, where are, where are the urban needs? Do you think that there's a need for better research on exclusion techniques, perhaps, and structures? Do you think that should be part of the mix? Do you think there should be some research needs on perhaps uh, better technology in, in work on how we can perform exclusion around structures? What are the standards? You th or... Is there any indication that maybe bats affect some, why do bats go into some buildings and others? Is it just simply because they're in disrepair 
or is, are there certain sides of the building that bats enter more often than others? Are there better way? Are there ways to uh, what happens to animals that we exclude from buildings? You know, a lot of wildlife control operators are getting into one-way doors. Uh, is that more humane? Is it humane to exclude a squirrel in the middle of February in the northern regions? Is that humane? What happens to that squirrel? How about some of the rodenticides that we use or the uh, pesticides we use maybe to kill moles? How effective are those products? Are, you know, who's doing the research to maybe capture moles and put some uh, a telemetry on them so we can actually get the body and, and confirm that they ate the poison and then died from it? How about for pocket gophers? So you can see that there are some there are some issues here. Uh, how effective is carbon monoxide, for example, on voles? That's with a V, on voles. Now I know some wildlife control operators say they've had great success with it, but I've seen complaints that people didn't find it effective. You know, I'm, I I I would my suspicion is. Vole control with 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 a fumigant would be pretty hard to accomplish, but I'm I'm happy to have my opinion change. Where's the data, right? So, um, where is this research being done? So let's continue down a little bit more. Here we have the private sector. These are the research needs by topic area for the private sector. Again, rabies is number one. Hard to imagine. That's a private sector issue, but I, okay. Predators, number two, then rodents and small animals, other methods and tools, drones, other research needs, deer, repellents and deterrents, human dimensions, fertility man management, feral swine, economics. Of course, federal agencies are going to have feral swine and, bird and aviation issues, and they're mostly birds and then some disease. So the bottom line here is, is I hope you take away that the National Wildlife Research Center is available and they do perform wildlife damage management research and they're very good at it. And they have, they've, they've done some incredible work over the years and this is your tax dollars at work. They are funded by taxpayer dollars. So my question is for the industry, Shouldn't we be part of that? I mean, I don't think we should be the number one issue. I think that's, no, and that's not what I'm suggesting. I mean, but do you think we should be part of that? Do you think that some of our national associations and state associations should maybe put some money aside and say, hey, how do we fund some research to help issues that are concerning us and our businesses so that maybe we can leverage that money into something bigger that some concerns that we have i think there's a big need for how are we performing clean outs for example out of attics and things of like this one we're cleaning up droppings i mean i've done some publishing in that area uh, but it was just a proposal draft proposal right just trying to start a conversation that we have some standardization in our industry um, it certainly wasn't the final word by any stretch of the imagination, but it was just trying to start the conversation. But we're not doing it. What about, you know, how are we dealing with some of these more complicated, humane issues? How are we going to do that, right? So this, these are questions that we need to start dealing with and waiting for government, waiting to react to whether negative legislation from the government or negative regulation that is the wrong way to be doing it because it's harder. We should be far more proactive rather than just simply reacting to various things. But again, uh, most people disagree with me and perhaps you do as well. But nevertheless, I do hope you found this information interesting about what the National Wildlife Research Center is doing and some of the projects that they're involved in. And you can learn more by getting this publication and I'll repeat the title of it for you again. And they can actually, there's actually a section here where they actually talk about various needs specifically that they are investigating or at a glance where they do all of these issues that came up and they basically write them down. And you can see what they're probably going to be doing some work on 
and that may help those of you in the more some of your more rural areas, maybe in your more agricultural areas. That research is being done and you need to kind of be paying attention to what the National Wildlife Research Center is doing because they could be coming up with a technique that could be very helpful for your business. It's just something for you to think about. I'm certainly going to be monitoring them over time, so I'll try to reach out and uh, give you some updates on that. But uh, I can't guarantee I'm always going to be getting that out in a timely manner, right, because it's just something for you to think about. Well, I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife. I do hope you'll take a few moments to uh, drop me a line at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. That's wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Love to hear about your comments and thoughts about the show, topics for future issues. Otherwise, as I said before, I'm just going to talk about what I'm interested in. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Do take a few moments, subscribe to the channel. Do visit me over on rumble.com if you're uh, wanting to get some updates there, but you could also do it from YouTube as well. And we would love to hear from you. And I do hope you're going to be safe out there and that you enjoy this holiday season. So again, you've been listening to Living the Wildlife. Why do we call it Living the Wildlife? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everyone.